Tell me about Randall Palsh. 
There we go. All right, perfect. I'm gonna hide this. All righty. Sorry about that. Where to go? Where's the presentation now? See you. Let me get started. I'll get started. Okay, so I think at this point everybody knows me here. Um, I'm Shraddha. Um, and the, today I'll be talking about pulmonary vascular disease. And I'll only be focusing on GPA and MPA because it's a pretty broad um, topic. So I'm not including eGPA in the talk today. Um, I have no disclosures. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so we've all, you know, seen this before. Um, when you look at primary vasculitis, essentially you can classify it as large uh, vessel vasculitis, medium vessel vasculitis, or small vessel vasculitis. The one that I'm going to focus on is the small vessel vasculitis. And um, within the small vessel vasculitis umbrella, you have the immune complex mediated vasculitis, which is the HSP, the uh, cryoglobulinemia uh, related vasculitis. Um, and you have the posse immune vasculitis, which is your ANCA vasculitis, that includes your GPA, granulomatosis with polyangitis, microscopic polyangitis, and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. And then you have secondary vasculitis, which could be secondary to autoimmune diseases like SLE, um, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, scleroderma, um, antiphospholipid anti um, syndrome, inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, drug induced um, is something to keep in mind. Um, drugs commonly associated. Um, so you don't see this that often, but when you do the drugs that are implicated, um, it, in um, vasculitis are PTU, um, hydralazine, cocaine. I've never seen a patient on diphenylhydantoin, um, but PTU, hydralazine, something to keep in mind. And then obviously you can have perineoplastic um, vasculitis and then infections. So ANCA associated vasculitis epidemiology. So for the most part, depending on the literature, um, where the literature is coming from. Um, it's, they've studied the epidemiology of the um, ANCA associated vasculitis in Europe and different countries in Europe, um, in North America, based on where you look at the data from. For the most part, it affects males and females almost equally. Um, peak incidence at about 65 to 75 years of age, but can, if you look at the range, it can, it, I've seen data stating nine to 75 years of age. Um, children can have um, vasculitis, and associated vasculitis too. Um, annual incidence is about 1.2 to two cases per 100,000 individuals, so not that common. And prevalence is uh, 4.6 to 18.4 cases per 100,000 individuals. And these numbers, probably have changed a little bit now. The data is from um, 2012, um, but we do tend to recognize these a little bit more um, these days. So it, it's a little bit of old data there. So pathophysiology. Now, it's a busy slide, but I think it's important to know the pathophysiology because a lot of the treatment um, modalities will you know, focus on um, some of these um, pathophysiological um, mediators. So. Essentially, you have some kind of an insult, an infection, um, or some kind of uh, insult that causes the neutrophils to prime. So you have neutrophil priming. What that means is the neutrophils start 
presenting the ANCA antigens, which is usually enclosed within the cytoplasm. It starts releasing and, and presenting them onto the surface. These ANCA antigens are then recognized by the, the, ANCA, um, the ANCA itself, which is the Y um, shape molecules you see there. And then once the ANCA binds to the ANCA antigens, it um, activates the neutrophils, um, which releases more cytokines, activates the complement pathway, which is going right up there. And then it attaches to the um, endothelium um, and starts the whole cascade of, you know, more inflammation, macrophages get, um, so neutrophils, macrophages, they all get um, recruited to that site. And then eventually you have a lot more macrophages, T lymphocytes that eventually end up causing the granulomatous formation, which is the last step that you see there. And it's important to remember, so you have the neutrophils, you have the complement pathway, you have the T cells, um, and the macrophage, and eventually the fibroblasts that will lay down the, um, the fibrinous network and collagen. So when you look at the organ involvement in ANCA vasculitis, um, so this study, um, it's from um, Jeanette et al. Um, from 2017. So what they looked at is for the patient characteristics on the basis of the ANCA specificity. So patients with PR3 ANCA um, positivity, about 61% of them had lung involvement and about half of them had ENT involvement. When you look at the MPO um, ANCA positivity, almost 100% of them had renal involvement. So that's why we see a lot more renal involvement in um, MPO or MPO mediated um, vasculitis or MPO ANCA mediated vasculitis. And then you see a lot more upper airway ENT involvement with the PR3 ANCA vasculitis. So Coming to GPA or granulomatosis with polyangitis, it was first described in 1931 by a medical student um, by the name of Heinz Klinger. Um, and then Dr. Wagner provided the detailed description about, of about three patients with similar illnesses in 1936 and 39. And that's why it ended up being called Wagner's granulomatosis. It was actually a medical student who first described it. Um, it was relatively unknown in the American literature till the 1950s when Godman and Churg actually pu published a detailed description of this disease. So for the diagnosis of GPA, so you have the 1990 ACR cri um, criteria, and then the more updated would be the 2012 um, Chapel Hill um, consensus um, nomenclature. So, by the ACR criteria, you need, you need any two of the following, two or more. So nasal or oral inflammation. And when you ask the patient, ask them about crusting, or sometimes they may not tell you when you ask them, do you have any you know, bleed? We ask about epistaxis, but I don't think we ask about you know, crusting or any mucosal involvement. So it's important to um, ask about that. Um, chest x-ray has so radiographic findings with nodules, infiltrates, um, or cavities. Urinary abnormalities like microhematuria or RBC casts, and obviously your know, biopsy, so histo, um, histo um, showing granulomatous inflammation. So if you have any two or more of the following, that gives you the diagnosis of the uh, GPA. And then 2012, um, the Chapel Hill consensus um, nomenclature. So essentially, they describe it as gra necrotizing granulomatous inflammation involving the upper and lower respiratory tract, that's important, affecting predominantly small to medium-sized vessels, and necrotizing glomerulonephritis is common. So Dr. Brown published this review article um, in um, the American Thoracic Society. And when you look at the um, clinical features and how common they are in this um, group of vasculitis, so pulmonary um, involvement is the most, um, pulmonary um, as well as upper airway um, are the most common, uh, are more commonly seen. Um, so about 70 to 95%. Renal involvement, like you can, um, see there's about 50 to 85%. And then 
you have cutaneous, you must have felt all ocular involvement, um, and then constitutional, cardiac, um, nervous system, not as common. Um, so upper airway, pulmonary, and um, kidneys are the big ones, but there are quite a few data on actually um, ocular um, GPA, um, but not as common. Okay, so what does GPA look like? We One of the criteria was, you know, the radiographic findings. So what does it look like on um, imaging? So what do you see here? So I'll tell you, this is a 42-year-old female who has um, GPA. What do you see here? Anybody? Yep. Yep. And then what would you say the distribution is for the ground glass? Central lobular. So you see more central lobular um, ground glass um, opacities. A little bit more subtle on the um, left, but definitely, you can definitely see it on the um, right. And that's from the hemorrhage, alveolar, this patient had alveolar hemorrhage. What do you see here? So what does the arrowhead show? It's it's not normal, right? So <laughs> yeah, it's a it almost a subplural ground glass nodule, right? And then what do you see with um, that the arrow is pointing at at the top? It's kind of similar to what you described. It's just it's ground glass um, nodule, but this one's more prominent, subplural, and larger. That's why you can see it better. That one's um, it's a ground glass um, opacity as well. And then, what do you see here? So this is somebody who uh, a sixty-five-year-old gentleman with GPA presenting with this, what do you see here? Should be too hard to describe. Nodules, right? It's bilateral um, upper lobe nodules. And would you say they're uniform? What, what, how would you describe the nodule per se? So it's, it's solid, right? It's not ground glass. How do the margins look? Slightly speculated? It's not, yeah, it's not like well-defined, right? And then this is three months later. So it's cavitated. What do you see here? So let's go top to bottom. I've circled it out, so <laughs> it'll be easier to. <laughs> so that's not normal. So Fluid. what is that? Hmm? So it, it was actually granulomatous tissue in the sinuses. Yep. Um, what, so, a, B are kind of similar. And then um, what's the last one? C. So you see how the wet? So there's septal perforation. Yeah. This might interest Daniel a little bit. <laughs> so it's virtual bronchoscopic image, but where do you think we are? We are in the, we are past the right main stem. What are we seeing here? Yep, middle lobe and the um, lower lobe takeoff, right? So what the arrow is pointing at is the orifice of the middle lobe, it's pretty narrowed. You don't see the, the carina distally, right? It's, it's pretty narrowed. So that was from the granulomatous inflammation, um, involvement of the airway itself. What do we see here? Yeah, I think so, Hip said it. Yeah, from the, from the 
granulomatous inflammation of the airway itself. And that's the coronal. But. Okay. So when we talk about ANCA PR3, so when you order, when you're looking for vasculitis and you order the ANCAs, you send a whole lot of mean workup, you send ANAs, ANCAs. Um, what, when they're reporting the P ANCA or C ANCA, it's somebody's lo actually looking at the, at the distribution of that staining. So it's, a, it's somebody manually looking at the staining and reporting the pattern of the staining. So the ANCA pattern, it's through indirect uh, immunofluorescence. And the two patterns that are, um, sometimes you can have a mixed pattern too, but um, the peripheral pattern. So you see the, the one on the left, you see it's highlighted more in the periphery of the nucleus. So it's, that's why it's the P ANCA pattern. It's in the periphery of the nucleus. And then if you see the, the right side image, that's where you see the, the immunofluorescence throughout the cytoplasm. So it's more cytoplasmic. So perinuclear or through the cytoplasm. And when we, sometimes when the patients have positive ANA, sometimes it may be hard to, they cannot read the pattern per se if, the, if there's already ANA um, positivity. So in those cases, you can actually check for your antibodies. So you can check for MPO or PR3 antibodies. And these are usually um, measured um, by the ELISA technique. And they can actually, a few years ago, they would, they would say if it's positive or negative, they can give you titers now. So they can give you, um, they'll give you MPO titers, PR3 titers. But these are the antibodies for these um, ANCA antigens. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, what does GPA look like on the um, slides, on the, his, on the pathology? Um, so what you see is, you see a lot of blue. So there's a lot of uh, basophilic nuclear debris and that's usually a sign of necrosis. Um, so anytime you see necrosis, um, liquefactive necrosis, you would see a lot of um, basophilic um, staining. What you see on the right is actually the, the vessel wall, it's completely infiltrated. You can't really say where the wall is, right? It's completely destroyed, but the inflammation is not uniform. You see more blue on one side of the, um, of the vessel wall. So there's more blue at the bottom right there um, where you have a lot of inflammation, histiocytes, and it has spared part of the um, area of the vessel. But this is what they describe as um, it's a, eccentric um, inflammation. So coming to um, microscopic polyangitis, it was first described by um, Dapson and colleagues in 1948. So essentially it was, there's the entity of PAN has been in literature, um, has been described well in the literature. Um, so what they described was it, it was a subset of patients with polyarthritis nodos, nodosa with the segmental necrotizing, um, with segmental necrotizing glomerulonephritis. The, actually, if you look at the 1990 ACR criteria, there's actually no criteria for classification of um, MPA. There's Shirkstra, there's EGPA, there's GPA, and there's um, P, uh, polyarthritis nodosa. There's no um, diagnostic criteria for MPA. It's the Chapel Hill International Consensus Criteria that described this entity um, in 2012. So necrotizing vasculitis of small vessels without granulomas, um, frequently associated with necrotizing glomerulonephritis and pulmonary capillaritis. So what are some of the common clinical features? So as we saw earlier in the previous slide too, with the um, incidence of organ involvement with some of these ankle associated vasculitis, kidneys are more, most commonly involved with, um, MP, uh, with MPA. So rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, almost 100% of them um, had this. Pulmonary involvement, about a third of them had pulmonary involvement, which is kind of consistent with the, um, with the data um, in the literature. You have the cutaneous manifestations, um, 
you have the nervous system involvement, GI involvement, um, and then a little bit of upper airway, but you're predominantly the features that you would be looking for are renal, those that, that involve the kidneys, pulmonary, and cutaneous. So like I mentioned before, there was no criteria for the diagnosis of MPA in the 1990 ACR criteria. It was the 1994 Chapel Hill um, International Consensus that defined this as a separate entity, which essentially it's the PAN and MPA, it's, they said it's probably part of a spectrum. Um, and in that the here with the MPA, you see um, more necrotizing vasculitis. So what do we see here? So this is a 76 year old woman who came with and had a diagnosis of microscopic polyangitis. I've put the arrows there. So if you can just describe those findings. So what about the double arrows? What do you see there? That should be easy. Plural fusion, right? Um, what about the, the arrow head? If you can see 2L1. It's a micronodule. It's hard to, it's probably hard to see, but it's micronodule. And then what do you see? Um, oh, the arrow won't show that. The, what is the arrow pointing at at the top? Yeah, brown glass and consolidation, right? So there's no classic. You know, this and with GPA, you see a, a lot more cavitation. Um, with MPA, um, there you see very non-specific features. So you'll see like micronodules, brown glass opacities. Um, you might see evidence of capillaritis, so diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, just diffuse ground glass. So cavitation is not as common with this disease as is with GPA. And so this is a pattern that you would commonly see with um, MPA. And I say commonly because MPA can also be C anchor positive. Not about a third of them can be C anchor positive, um, but most commonly you'll see the, um, the P anchor or the MPO um, vasculitis. So here is the grading of the disease severity. And why this is important is because the treatment recommendations will be based on the severity of the disease. Um, the, and the way they classify the disease severity, it goes from limited to um, refractory, or once you get treated, you're probably in remission at that point, hopefully. So it, it's based on organ involvement um, and this five-factor score, and I'll talk about it briefly. Um, so the limited is just isolated upper airway. A lot of times we may not come across a lot of these patients, you know, you may not see them, you know, in the ICU. A lot of times we see vasculitis patients in the ICU that are pretty severe, have, you know, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or have multiple organ involvement um, and severe. So we usually see them, see them at either severe or um, uh, refractory. But if you just have isolated upper airway disease, five factor score of zero. Essentially treatment options would be corticosteroids or methotrexate. So if you don't have to do higher um, immunosuppression with cyclophosphamide or rituximab or anything of that sort, you can just get away with methotrexate or azathioprine. If you talk about early generalized, which means there's end, end organ involvement, but there's no evidence of immediate threat to the um, organ function. So say somebody presenting with glomerulonephritis, creatinine is um, say uh, creatinine is 1.3, baseline is 0.8. Um, might have some pulmonary nodules, but so you have the organ involvement, but there's no immediate threat to organ failure. Um, the five factor score usually is around zero to one. And then generalized active is you have um, an organ involvement, but then now there's significant impairment to, um, of organ function. So if you're talking about glomerulonephritis, serum creatinine is more than 1.4, um, but less than 
Um, you see palmar infiltrates may present with some cough, some dyspnea, um, dyspnea and exertion and impaired exercise tolerance. And then when you talk about severe, you think about cases that you see in the ICU, right? It's severe, immediate threat to organ failure um, or death. So you see severe renal, renal disease, patients in acute renal failure, or you see patients with alveolar hemorrhage, um, heart failure, cardiomyopathy. So these are, you know, things that will, um, that has high mortality associated with it. And then refractory, obviously, if these are the patients that have already been treated with something and the disease is um, not controlled, has failed to respond. And then remission is once you've start, started the patient therapy and now they have no evidence of ongoing um, disease activity. And we'll talk a little bit about treatment in, um, in the coming slides. So five-factor score. So a lot of the vasculitis data, you'll see this um, scoring system being used. Uh, it was developed by the French vasculitis um, study group, and it's validated for MPA, uh, polyarthritis nodosa, and Chirk strap. They called it Chirk strap back then, but EGPA. Um, and a few years later, it was um, even validated for GPA patients. So you can use it across the board for vasculitis patients. And you get essentially you get one point for each. So age more than 65, renal insufficiency, GI involvement cardiac involvement, and absence of airway, absence of upper airway disease. And a score of two or more carries a mortality of about 40%. And that's why we use this for grading the disease severity, because that will give you the, help you prognosticate and um, respond to, um, respond with um, therapeutic agents um, based on the um, severity. And a score of zero is actually mortality of nine. So you can, that's why we, with, you know, just upper airway disease, you can get away with, you know, methotrexate or azathioprine. So why, why do we worry about it? Why treat ankylvasculitis? Um, so before any immunosuppression, the mortality associated with, so even before steroids, when, you know, people didn't know what to do with it, um, the mortality was about 75% um, with this disease. And median survival was five months. So pretty grave prognosis. Then came around um, steroids, and that improved the mortality at one year, but showed no um, impact at three, at three year mortality and uh, five year mortality was again at least half the patients with this disease, even though they get treated with steroids, died. So mortality was about fifty percent. And then with cyclophosphamide, that dramatically improved um, the mortality from. 50% to 12%. So significant improvement in mortality um, with cyclophosphamide. And if you look at the curve here, um, the survival curve, so it, the x-axis is months of follow-up and the y-axis is the survival probability. So higher, the better. So if you look at general population and vasculitis, these are patients that were treated appropriately with vasculitis. And even the patients that were treated with vasculitis with you know, guideline um, recommended therapy, their survival is still lower compared to general population. And it just goes to show that you know, it's important to treat, treat this disease. It's important to recognize the presence of the disease and treat it promptly and treat it aggressively. So coming to the management. So you have a new diagnosis of ANCA associated vasculitis. You're, I'm going to focus mo mostly on the organ or life-threatening or rapidly progressive um, disease. So when you have organ or life-threatening disease, or say you started with organ or life-threatening disease, and now you end up with a rapidly progressive disease with either pulmonary hemorrhage, renal failure, this is the, um, uh, the algorithm you would essentially follow. So... Cyclophosphamide, when you look at organ of, or life-threatening disease, cyclophosphamide or rituximab with steroids. And you'll see with all these regimens, with cyclophosphamide, rituximab, you always have steroids at baseline in addition to these immunosuppressants. So what data do we have for use of rituximab versus cyclophosphamide? Uh, this is a landmark trial in the treatment of vasculitis. It's called the, um, the RAVE trial, and the research group is the RAVE um, International Network Research Group. 
Um, and there was actually a, a long-term follow-up from this um, trial as well. But this is uh, this was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. So it was a multi-centered, randomized, one-to-one uh, -one randomization, double-blinded, double-dummy, non-inferiority trial. There's a lot of information here, but things to remember. So in the inclusion criteria, they had to have a, um, a ANCA positive um, vasculitis. So sometimes when we see patients who have, we say, you know, GPA, but they are seronegative, they are ANCA negative vasculitis, those patients were not included in the study. Um, some of the exclusion criteria, patients that had EGPA or um, GBM, they were excluded from the study. Patients who had really severe disease where they had alveolar hemorrhage or our on mechanical ventilation were excluded from the study. And that's because if the disease is that severe enough, rituximab takes a few weeks to have full effect. You don't want to wait that long. Um, so a lot of these patients will end up getting cyclophosphamide and we'll go over the data for that too. But these were the patients that were not in that rapidly progressing, um, like alveolar hemorrhage or um, severe enough requiring mechanical ventilation. So their primary outcome was to uh, was a BVS, and I'll show you what that score means here. There. So I know it's hard to see, but essentially it's a scoring system um, that include based on the the symptoms, uh, based on the organ involvement. So essentially, a score of um, three or more. Um, indicates active disease, and higher the score, the more active the disease is. So a score of zero, meaning somebody who's in remission or has, um, so the primary outcome was essentially for the patients to reach rem remission and successful completion of prednisone taper at six months. So essentially you want patients to be off steroids and achieve remission by six months. That was the primary outcome. Secondary outcome, there were a bunch of secondary outcomes that they looked at, including rates of disease flares, um, uh, remission during treatment with prednisone dose less than 10. Um, if you can't take them completely off of prednisone, but at least get them less than 10 milligrams a day. Um, and then they looked at cumulative glucocorticoid doses that these patients were, um, received adverse events. And that's a um, SF36, the question, um, quality of life questionnaire. So essentially there were 197 patients, 99 were assigned to um, the rituximab group, 98 were assigned to the cy cyclophosphamide group. And I was impressed because all 99 of those patients actually completed the trial and made it to the analysis. So on both ends, so 90, 99, so all the patients that received the rituximab were included in the analysis and 98 on the cyclophosphamide. Some of, so based on characteristics, pretty similar between the, um, between the two groups. As you can see, the, the baseline um, BBS score, 8.5, 8.2, pretty similar. So they're well matched. We talked about this. So the rituximab group, essentially they got rituximab um, 375 um, milligrams per body, body surface area. Um, so rituximab essentially Q four weeks, every four weeks for four weeks. Uh, and then a daily placebo cyclophosphamide. So they, they did, this was a, they did do a dummy um, and placebo control, right? So rituximab every four weeks for treatments with daily uh, placebo cyclophosphamide and then the Cyclophosphamide group, they did daily two milligram per kilogram plus weekly placebo um, rituximab infusion. And if remission was achieved at three to six months, they switched the cyclophosphamide to azathioprine, which is standard of care. Um, and then both groups had the steroid taper. So one to three uh, pulses of solimedrol, 1,000 milligrams each. So three days, so say they got three gram. Um, followed by one milligram per kilogram daily 
tapered by five months, and if remission was achieved, steroids were decent. So essentially, rituximab group, at six months of remission was achieved, they were not on any therapy after. The steroids were discontinued, they finished the rituximab. The cyclophosphamide group were, if they achieved remission, tapered off of steroids, but continued on the azathioprine. So the primary outcome, um, so when you look at the, um, the differences in complete remission rate, so essentially it met the criteria for non-inferiority. However, it did not meet the criteria for the superiority. So they, since they met the, it met the criteria for non-inferiority, so rituximab was non-inferior to cyclophosphamide. They, because of that, they did the superiority um, analysis and essentially didn't find it to be superior. So both are similar. Um, it's, rituximab is not, uh, is not inferior to, um, cyclophosphamide. So we talked about that. So essentially the cyclophosphamide group, they were on at least some therapy. They were on azathioprine even after achieving remission. The cyclophosphamide group, didn't, the rituximab group didn't get um, any. But, and then at 18 months, the proportion of patients remaining in complete remission, similar between two groups, 39 versus 33%. Um, mm -hmm. So complete remission, they maintained remission at um, 18 months, even though the rituximab group was not on any therapy after six months. What was interesting is um, when they looked at the patient characteristics, so the patients that, that, so you had some patients that had a new diagnosis and there were some patients that had relapsed and were in, included in the trial. The patients that were, or the relapsers, actually responded better to rituximab than cyclophosphamide. And this was um, clinically significant with a p-value of 0 0.13. Adverse events essentially were similar in um, both groups. Um, and that included, obviously when you look at the cyclophosphamide group, you see complication of hemorrhagic cystitis. Um, one thing you want to keep in mind is, especially when you have younger patients, Fertility issues is big. So sometimes, you know, if you know they're going to be on cyclophosphamide, you might want to ask them to, you know, freeze their eggs or, you know, have the fertility treatment, you know, before starting this drug. And there's a cumulative lifetime dose of cyclophosphamide that you can get, after which it is not recommended to be on cyclophosphamide because of these long-term effects. And if it, there's some association with um, bladder cancers, long-term cancer. So there's, that's what, and we'll, the next trial we'll talk about um, essentially shows the why we use, you know, why should we use IV or oral and what the logic is with cyclophosphamide. Um, so essentially adverse events, not no difference between the two groups. So from this study, what we figured out was rituximab was non-inferior to cyclophosphamide um, for induction um, in encovasculitis. The next study is was the by the UVAS study group called the Cyclops trial, and then there was like a um, long term follow up of it as well. So the Cyclops, what they did here was to look at IV versus oral cyclophosphamide, which one is better. And I don't know, you probably can see that, but that the bottom one. I'm sorry. I, didn't show up too well, but it was just a long-term follow-up of the initial Cyclops trial. So again, this was a multi-center randomized control trial over 18 months, um, randomization to either da daily oral cyclophosphamide or pulse um, IV cyclophosphamide. And essentially they received the cyclophosphamide until remission plus extra three months. Um, and the treatment was, they were under treatment for at least six months no more than 12 months. And that's because of the cumulative um, dose of cyclophosphamide. They do not recommend being on, you know, crossing that maximum dose. So maximum 12 months, minimum six months. And both these groups, like I said, with the previous trial too, were on a steroid regimen in addition to the cyclophosphamide. The primary outcome was time to remission um, and the secondary outcomes were patients who achieved remission at um, six and nine months um, 
proportion of major and minor relapses, death, and a lot more um, adverse effects. So again, um, patient characteristics pretty well matched. And one thing to note here is they did include patients that were um, ANCA negative. So this study did include, in contrast to the rate trial, this did include patients that were um, ANCA negative. So time to remission, as you can see here, there's no difference, right, between oral and um, the pulse dose. So no difference in time to remission. Cumulative doses, so the, with the cumulative doses, the pulse dose um, received much less, almost half the amount than the oral dose um, cyclophosphamide. And this was clinically significant. So the white bar up there, that's oral, and the green is the IV. So the IV dose got, the pulse um, dose patients got much lower doses, almost half than what the um, oral dose uh, patients did. Survival. Um, again, no difference between the two groups. And then relapse. So if we had just looked at the cumulative doses, knowing the side effects, we would have said, why don't we just do, you know, IV pulse dose cyclophosphamide? Why do we, you know, even bother doing oral? And this is why. So the risk of relapse is actually higher. So the y-axis is the patients without relapse. So again, higher, the better. Um, so, and the solid line is the patient that received oral, and then the lighter gray line is the pulse dose. And this is why the patients that were on pulse dose had higher risk of relapse and oral cyclophosphamide. And that's why even though there's a, the trial showed that they received cumulative doses were higher, but there was lower rate of um, relapse. And then the one on the right, if you see, it looks at the relapse based on not just the oral and IV, but also the, um, the PR3 positive. And that tells you something about the prognostication, right? If the patients are PR3 positive, they're higher risk of relapse. And that's what you see that, um, that's where you see um, the graphs. So if you look at the dotted lines, so the black dotted line is the patient's um, who received the oral dose and were PR3 negative compared to the solid black line, even though they both received oral doses, one was PR3 positive, one was PR3 negative, the patients that were PR3 positive had higher risk of relapse. So when they did the longitudinal um, uh, long-term follow-up, they saw the factors that were associated with relapse um, in the multivariate analysis were obviously, we saw that in the graphs before, the patients that were on um, IV, um, pulse dose steroids, they had high risk of relapse and this was clinically significant. And same thing with the PR3 positivity, uh, patients that are PR3 positive have a higher risk of relapse as well. And then they looked at the duration of the treatment. So was there any difference so with, after they, after the study period, was there any difference in um, the patients um, in the duration of the steroid regimen, um, even beyond the original study, and there was no difference. So patients did not require more steroids that didn't have more flares compared to the, um, between the oral versus the IV pulse dose. Adverse events were similar as well. So these were the two main trials. So rituximab, not inferior to cyclophosphamide in not in patients where you can, that have alveolar hemorrhage or severe or me, requiring mechanical ventilation, but severe enough where they might have like some renal fun, dysfunction, some nodules. Um, and then the, when you're using the cyclophosphamide, if you consider using the cyclophosphamide oral versus IV, oral um, lower risk of relapse. So what about maintenance? So once the, once the patient achieves remission and you put them on the maintenance therapy. There are three trials. One is the improved trial that looked at the um, mycophenolate um, mofetil versus the azathioprine uh, for remission. And this was published in JAMA in 2010. So it was an open label randomized control trial, 42 centers across Europe. Um, and this 
essentially their inclusion criteria was any newly diagnosed ankle associated vasculitis and exclusion criteria again any previous exposure to any of the cytotoxic drugs were excluded any presence of other autoimmune diseases were excluded as well and similar to the other study patients that were randomized to the either the azathioprine group or the uh, mmf group they most of them were included all of them actually were included in the primary analysis so I just put the regimen there, but essentially that's just a long steroid paper regimen in both groups. Um, this is only for people who might be interested in what the regimen looked like, but this was 24 months of steroid um, that the patients were on uh, tapering doses in both groups. In addition to the steroids, the mycophenolate group received 2000 milligrams per day of MMF reduced to 1500 after 12 months, after a year, dropped it down to 1500. 1,000 at 18 months, so after a year and a half, down to 1,000, and then withdrawn after 42 months. So long study period. Azathioprine group, similarly, was in 2 milligram per kilogram per day of azathioprine, um, and the dose was slowly increased. Um, essentially, maximum, when they did per um, kilogram uh, body weight, the maximum dose, um, the threshold was 200 milligrams. If and then the dose was reduced to one and half, 1.5 milligram per kilogram from two milligram per kilogram per day after a year, and then a milligram per kilogram after 18 months, and then withdrawn after 42 months. So slow tapers over uh, 42 months. So time to first relapse. So what you see here is, so x-axis is the time, y-axis is the um, proportion of patients with the post relapse. So higher is the worst, meaning they had more patients had um, relapses. So the mycophenolate arm actually had more patients um, with relapse with a clinically um, significant uh, p value of 0 0.03. Major relapse, not as different, maybe some trend, um, 0.054, so just barely meeting. Um, Actually, not, not meaning the uh, clinically significant criteria, but almost there. But essentially, in general, trend shows that mycophenolate high risk of relapse as compared to azathioprine. And then secondary outcomes, there was no difference in any of their secondary outcomes. Adverse effects, again, if you look at the p no clinical significant um, difference between the two groups. So we looked at azathioprine and MMF. What about methotrexate? So this was published in um, New England Journal of Medicine. And what they did was essentially um, compared azathioprine versus methotrexate for um, maintenance therapy. Um, the oral azathioprine group essentially two milligram, that's the standard dose, two milligram per kilogram per day for 12 months. Methotrexate was 0.3 milligram per kilogram per week progressively increased to 25 milligrams per week for 12 months. And one thing to um, remember is their initial um, induction was, for all these patients was with um, cyclophosphamide. So they received either IV or oral cyclophosphamide, achieved remission, and then they were put on this maintenance therapy. Primary endpoint was any adverse event causing discontinuation of the drug or death. And then secondary endpoints were other adverse events and relapses. And what you see here is with the time to adverse event, so that was the primary outcome um, or death, no clinically significant difference between the two arms. Time to first relapse, no different. And again, time to first event, no difference. So essentially, no difference between azathioprine or um, methotrexate. These are the adverse effects. Um, and with the adverse effects, I think um, patients with the um, methotrexate had slightly more mucosal toxicity, um, uh, mucosal um, adverse effects. And I, there was one, but 
Yeah. So appeared similar um, from the adverse effects um, standpoint. So their working theory was that methotrexate might be um, might have a better toxicity profile than azathioprine, which was not the case um, in this study. And then the last, which so recently um, there's a they've looked into using rituximab as um, a remission um, aid as a maintenance um, therapy. And in addition to these, there's another ongoing trial looking at the rituximab for um, maintenance and ankylosis. Um, but essentially, there are two randomized controlled trials, um, main RITSAN-1, main RITSAN-2, um, essentially compared, the first one was comparing rituximab to azathioprine, um, and they actually saw superiority at um, 28 months, and that was sustained at 60 months, so did show superiority, and the second trial, they actually were looking at using fixed dose rituximab versus individualizing um, rituximab, and um, Essentially, um, with that, the fixed dose seemed to be, um, see, they did a little bit better than the individualized um, therapy. So, I know that was a lot of just dry data, but I'll summarize it here. So, key points it's important to recognize and treat vasculitis, um, inca associated vasculitis because of what we saw, it has high mortality, untreated vasculitis has high mortality, um, and even patients that do get treated still tend to have lower survival than, um, than the control group. And then the agents that you would use for induction, rituximab, not inferior to cyclophosphamide, but this is when you see patients in the clinic with some pulmonary nodules, some kidney dysfunction. These the rituximab is not something you would use when you have patients on the vent with diff diffuse elevated hemorrhage. Um, usually, our preferred agent would be cyclophosphamide. When you're using cyclophosphamide for induction in some of these severe um, organ threatening um, diseases, oral is preferred over IV because of the um, reduced risk of relapse. Um, as compared to the pulse um, regimen. And then beware of the toxicity when you're thinking of cyclophosphamide. Um, just make sure you, uh, you know, counsel your patients um, beforehand before starting the medication. And then for maintenance, azathioprine better than mycophenolate due to ink because mycophenolate has increased risk of relapse as compared to azathioprine. Azathioprine and methotrex are kind of similar, although there's a trend towards more adverse effects, but not clinically significant in the trial we looked at. So if somebody can't tolerate any of these, you may consider methotrexate. Um, and rituximab, definitely better than cyclophosphamide um, and azathioprine at re um, reducing relapses. And when you're looking at prognosis, what patients do you think will relapse? Um, things to consider are patients with PR3 positivity or um, lung involvement and patients with GPA. Uh, so these are the patients that have high risk of vascular and that's why we treat them for so long uh, with immunosuppressants. Thank you. And Dr. Tavraja helped me since I'm an ILD. <laughs> and hopefully this will wake you up. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. or yep. I think the last one was absence, absence of airway disease. So the absence of the by is you one point, yeah. Because when you have up, upper airway disease, that's kind of a more limited disease. So okay. when you look at the grading criteria, your zero grade zero was just upper airway was, and the uh, the BVAS score was zero essentially for that. So if you have just upper airway involvement, that's considered to be a good sign. Um, it you know, it's a limited disease. So yeah, so absence of it will buy you a... Any other questions? Hey, Ben. Oh, yeah. 